Hey everyone, Chat Cemetery is back, as is Drew Deach. We are continuing our discussion on 80s movies with possibly one of the not so great ones in <laughs> Children of the Corn. It came out in 1984, so we're almost to the midway mark in the 80s here. But this one, even though it's probably my least favorite thing of Stephen King's that I have consumed so far, <laughs> it is still important to talk about because I think the story is definitely better than any of the adaptations, but it's still on the odd side, even for Stephen King. Yeah, I this was actually I've seen the movie before and I and I rewatched it for this episode, but I had never read the short story before and I felt, well, I better <laughs> do that. And and the short story really is the the purest distillation of what you kind of get in the movie. Like the, it, most of if you know, there's a couple story changes, but the gist of it is pretty much exactly the same, but the movie does a couple things which which we can talk about um but yeah i mean like you say i th children of the corn is an important movie in the stephen king filmography i mean it's a it's something that i think is kind of cemented itself in pop culture like if you called a kid like wow he's a real child children of the corn kid you'd be like oh i know exactly what that means yeah despite the odd factor you do know what that means and i think that sort of goes to show how many people have watched this movie even well after the fact. You know, I did not watch this until the last year or two, I want to say, for the first time when it was on Netflix. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's still on Netflix. I'd have to look on that. But I was like, all right, you know what? It's here. I'm going to watch it. And I did that before I even decided to do this podcast. So I was like, oh, OK, that was the thing I just watched. <laughs> <laughs> that that is that is the perfect pull quote for the cover of <laughs> Children of the Corn. This was a thing I watched. Um, no, yeah, uh, I I I recently at, as of this recording, you know, it, it was available streaming on Hulu, so I watched okay. that and was probably the best presentation of it that I've seen uh, as far as you know HD transfer and everything. Um, but I'm uh, th there are things to be impressed about by Children of the Corn more so with its legacy than i would say the actual movie uh the, the movie was made for eight hundred thousand dollars and ended up raking in 14 and a half million yeah. at the box office so it was a very significant success and you know uh, like i said about if you called a, a kid a you know he's a real children of the corn it's kind of like dogs in cujo right you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it, you, know you can never call it <laughs> yeah exactly so so you I, I do respect the impact that Children of the Corn has had on pop culture and for being part of the real 80s renaissance of Stephen King film adaptations. That being said, I don't think it's a very good movie, <laughs> to say the least. And we can, I guess we can start getting into the particulars of why that is. Yeah, I want to touch on the casting real quick, though, because you mentioned that $800,000 budget, which is next to nothing. And you really only have a few people in this movie who might even be recognizable. You have Peter Horton, Linda Hamilton, R.G. Armstrong, and Courtney Gaines, who all of them went on to do stuff after this. But for the most part, just looking at the IMDb page, most of these actors in this movie don't even have pictures on IMDb. So I think that sort of contributes <laughs> to why they were able to keep it such a low budget. And a lot of them don't even have names. It's just like boy, dad, mom, <laughs> and yep. that sort of thing. I, I found it interesting because I was like, okay, I know this came out in 1984 and the Terminator came out in 1984. And I was wondering, you know, Linda Hamilton, I'm like, well, did she have any kind of real star making turns before that? And looking it up, Children of the Corn came out seven months before Terminator. And so Children of the Corn was really the first time she had... It wasn't the first time she had been a main player in a feature film, but this was definitely her biggest success up to this point. And then seven months later, she would be cemented as Sarah Connor in The Terminator. Much so, better know, She role. had a good... Oh, by, <laughs> by far. Well, and I think it's worth saying that Linda Hamilton, by a significant margin... Uh, outacts everybody in this film I, I oh yeah I think if I think if not for her performance across the board the performances would either be uh 
unengaging or unintentionally comedic uh, <laughs> at times. But Hamilton, you can see in this movie, it's like, oh, yeah, she's she is definitely going to go on to bigger and better things. I think that's what makes part of this movie interesting, too. You l- take a look at the cast and you're like, oh, you can kind of tell this was a low budget film and they weren't really shooting to get huge stars in it. You know, it's not Jack Nicholson in The Shining or even having some bigger actors in the Salem's Lot 1979 adaptation for television. You sort of just have these people who might look a little familiar, but like you said, at this point in time, Linda Hamilton wasn't a huge star yet. That would come in the same year, but not because of this movie. No, uh, in fact, I would say this is kind of a an interesting period because the star of the movie is Stephen King's name on the poster. Right. Like, that's what's getting people to actually come and see these movies is just, oh, it's Stephen King. And I I found it interesting researching this that he wrote a draft of this movie and was it was originally going to be his screenplay. But when the producers got a hold of it, they were like, this is not what we're looking for. You have the first 30 pages, which would be equivalent to about the first half hour of the movie, were just... Uh, Linda Hamilton and Peter Horton's characters, Vicky and Bert, arguing in their car, which is what the short story is. Like that, it it takes time at the beginning to build up this kind of rough, possibly you know on the edge marriage between these two characters, and eventually King's script was pretty much rewritten wholesale. And I I find that a bummer because reading the short story. It's way more interesting to have these two characters be pretty much on the outs as as a couple. Like they're just they're just shy of beating the crap out of each other. They hate each other and then they get thrown into this terrifying situation. Whereas in the movie, the main conflict between them isn't they're they're very romantic and sweet and fun, but the main conflict is that oh, Bert won't commit to getting married, which feels so tacked on and and doesn't doesn't really feed in to the the greater narrative or the the conflict that they end up you know coming into contact with I totally agree and you have moments in this movie like you said where you can see that Linda Hamilton is going to be the one who comes out on top basically and the fact that you have a ton of kids in this and nothing really came of a lot of their careers essentially except for maybe a couple of the main kids that we see that actually have names and aren't just boy (laughs) so (laughs) you have a pretty big cast for this at one point when you have all of the gatherings and ritualistic things going on but one of the things that really made this feel like such an 80s movie were the visuals because you have you know these things going on in the sky and it just looks so so bad these days and you can tell because they didn't use practical effects on some of the stuff and I've always said that practical effects age way better than Mm -hmm. some of the visual effects from the 80s but even if you take a look at something like Star Wars from the late 70s you're like okay yes this is very 70s but because of the fact that they used more practical effects than they did with trying to use graphics and everything like that. It still holds up today, but with Children of the Corn, yes, people like you and I will still watch it today, but that doesn't mean it'll look good today. Well, I, you're right. Like in the when the movie does end up engaging in some effects work, it's like, oh yeah, uh, uh. but I think even I think compounding that is that I don't think you walk into Children of the Corn expecting an effects movie. Oh, no, like, not at you, all. It, all you know is like, okay, it, town full of killer kids. That's all you need to sell me on. And and I'll even admit, I think the first act or so of this movie is pretty effective at the setup. We get a basically kind of see the uprising of the kids as they 
lock down a diner and, and kill a bunch of adults and and you're like oh okay i i get what's going on and that's a co- cool setup then cut to our couple who are eventually going to drive into the middle of this thing and, and that's all you really need but then there's this whole other supernatural element to the movie which which is present in the story but there's no real visible presence in the short story it is just kind of this deity that that these kids worship and there's a a kind of perversion of old testament ideas and and that's a cool creepy concept and i think it's actually one of the reasons it works in the short story but when you actually decide to take that to the next level in this movie it ends up being either kind of like you're saying from an effect standpoint, like, oh, that's not that's not really uh, working for me. Or it ends up just being outright silly, as <laughs> yeah. in when when the corn stalks are actually opening up or or trying to trap characters. And and, and maybe this will come up when we get to another Children of the Corn movie. But the fact that. Killer corn is a inherently silly concept, but the movie tonally treats everything super serious, and that's where that disconnect forms. No doubt, and it's not just the graphics that I would consider in the visual regard for this movie, because there are some visuals that really do work, and I particularly love the house that they find, and then they run yes. in and try to barricade themselves in there, but you have these other moments when the kids are gathering and you have the skeleton up like a scarecrow and up on the cross and everything. And then you have later Isaac up there. And I think they do have some powerful imagery in some of those moments. And I really feel like that John Franklin as Isaac sort of really nailed the creepy kid look because I was just running through some pictures real quick and I was like oh yeah he's the one who definitely looked evil oh I mean he I'm sure when he walked in for the audition they didn't need to hear him speak they were like oh yeah he looks like a a a Damien type or he he's a kid that looks way older than he probably is which is also in of itself creepy yeah he's like an adult in a kid's body right exactly like you're like oh man he looks like a 40 year old in a 12 year old's body (laughs) and and that's great visually. And there's actually one of my probably my favorite shot in the movie is during that uh, diner scene when all the kids are killing everybody and Isaac's just standing outside and the camera does this real big dolly zoom up to him and it's kinetic and kind of like, oh, OK. Um, but unfortunately, these kids are all saddled with like Bible belt biblical talk right. that never sounds natural coming from. I mean, it's it's hard enough for younger actors to do you know do things that are asked of them where they're trying to do more adult performances and they're they're asked that of this of this movie but also then you pile on top of well we're also going to want you to speak a bunch of like minister old testament speak and it just never feels natural totally and i think you know we can dive into the story a little more here because when you think of Stephen King stories, at least for me, Children of the Corn isn't really the first one to come to mind, but I kind of get where he was going with this story. You know, when you're in these cornfields, you're kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And one could argue that at this point in time, Maine as a whole was the middle of nowhere, but (laughs) which is where most of his stories take place. And I don't really know the details on where exactly this is it feels like it's in maine but at the same time i'm like you know this could be any highway in america in the 80s pretty much that would have some cornfields hanging off on the side of the road it it takes place in nebraska that's where that's where gatlin is and there's actually a a reference to uh hemmingford in this movie which is hemmingford home in in the stand okay uh, which is where mother abigail is yes nice catch (laughs) yeah and and i like that king's you know i mean it it makes sense for the the rural setting that he's making but i like that it's a guy who's lived in maine his whole life and to him a place like nebraska would seem like another planet (laughs) um and and i will say that again in the short story and in the concept itself that is a great creepy setting um you know the, and the idea of 
Uh, I, if I remember in the short story, uh, Bird at one point is saying, like, you could just, as soon as you stepped into the, the corn, you can imagine yourself getting lost and taking a week to try and get yourself out. And it's like, yeah, that is a, that's a cool, creepy idea. Um, and, and and the story, I, I think the thing that I took the most umbrage with this this watch is after reading the short story, learning that the new script that they did after Stephen King submitted his draft, they added in new characters. And and these are the characters of Job and Sarah, who are the two kids who aren't really jiving with what's going on in the town. And they kind of are off on their own and they're not going to these sermons that, that Isaac are doing. Right. And there's two problems with setting, putting them into the movie. One is that it splits the focus up, so we aren't spending the right amount of time with either Job and Sarah or Bert and Vicky. And two, there is unmotivated voiceover in these parts from Job's character, where there's there's nowhere else that voiceover appears in the movie. And it's all voiceover that feels like... It, it, this is always a good test for if your movie needs voiceover. If you can pull the voiceover out and still understand what's going on from the visual language of the movie, you don't need that voiceover. And yeah. that kind of happens in every scene where Job is saying, Mal you know, Malachi got all the adults there at the diner and I was waiting at the diner. And I'm like, I know, I'm I'm seeing this <laughs> right now. Um and Job and Sarah never feel like fully formed characters, even when they end up intersecting with Bert and Vicky. Uh, it, it's something that I think you could remove from the movie entirely and it wouldn't affect the structure terribly. In a movie that already has a handful of characters that you do want to focus on, it did seem unnecessary to sort of just throw these other two kids in who weren't quite as interesting as Isaac or even Malachi. Mm -hmm. No, I, yeah, it, it, it would make more sense, I think, if they wanted to intercut between s stories, it should be Bert and Vicky and then Isaac and Malachi because there ends up being a tension between Isaac and Malachi towards the end of the movie that does not feel properly set up. If we could have spent more time with them as two characters and seen that, you know, Malachi is beginning to distrust Isaac and think he's, you know, leading everything the wrong way. If that was better set up, that that payoff at the end would feel more earned. Um but even more so, I think one of the biggest problems with the movie is that as the audience, we are always two steps ahead of the characters. And by the time Bert and Vicky come into town and see what's going on, they're playing catch up to us. It, I think it would have been a lot smarter to take direct inspiration from the short story and just keep us in Bert and Vicky's perspectives. And just had us discovering what's going on. Because by the time they get to the town and they're walking around and looking at empty houses and stuff, we're like, yeah, we know it's a town of killer kids. Like, can can things get going? <laughs> and that really doesn't happen until the third act of the movie. Yeah, it's not paced very well. And it, at times, doesn't seem like a very cohesive story either. Like you mentioned, we don't really spend enough time with Job and Sarah. And that sort of just kind of takes you out of the movie for those moments if you haven't already been taken out of it by that point. But you have this story that could work pretty well. And part of me wonders if that's why there's so many adaptations of this, because one, cornfields are probably pretty low budget to film in. And <laughs> they only have really a few buildings that they need to set scenes in. And I think, you know, it's something where you have the story of killer kids and killer anything really is always going to attract people to the story. But I think with kids, it's a little different and probably also harder to work with kids and have them be killer kids unless it's John Franklin, who, like you said, just probably walked in and immediately seemed perfect for the role. But <laughs> you have this story and at the core of it. It's like, okay, I really know what they're getting at here. But when you try to execute it, it seems like it falls pretty flat, especially in this one. And I haven't watched any of the other ones, so I can't really speak to those. And 
like I've mentioned before, we'll see how many I end up getting to because <laughs> I don't know how many of these I can take if this is what they start out with. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I, I I can only speak to seeing the first three and then I, I kind of bailed. Um, but but you talk about the, the structuring of, of the story. And I think one of the biggest problems of the movie comes down to editing. There is yeah. a tendency in this movie to jump between two scenes of action or, you know, and, and I don't mean action as in like the typical, uh, you know, fight scene or something. I mean, characters doing things, discovering things, and it it removes tension from a scene. For example, the, the big example that I found so jarring is there is a gas station that's, uh, you know, a couple miles outside of Gatlin that's run by this old man uh, played by R.G. Armstrong. And eventually the kids are going to go and, and kill him uh, for reasons and and when he's skulking around you know trying to see if the killer kids are there the scene will then cut back to Bert and Vicky maybe almost getting to Gatlin and then cut back to the gas station scene and it it struck me because I'm like well you should just stay with this one scene stay with the scene in the gas station with the kids coming and they're going to kill. We know what's going to happen. Just let it play out. But by jumping back and forth, it, it creates a disconnect in your brain with, with the pacing. And that happens a number of times in the movie, which starts to make it feel like it's not going anywhere because as soon as something starts happening, you're like, Oh, something's happening. We got to cut to something else. And you're starting all over again with a scene. Right. I kind of wonder if something like, split screen would have made for some better editing choices in this because you mentioned not needing those voiceovers because you were seeing what was happening and there are plenty of moments in here where you don't really need any of the characters to be speaking you could have just shown okay this is what's going on here and this is what's going on here you know like for instance when Bert and Vicky are in the house Instead of cutting, it almost would have been cool to see the kids on one half of the screen surrounding the house and the other half have it be them inside the house. And, you know, I've never edited video in that kind of way. So I don't know <laughs> if that would have made things more difficult, but I think it would have been a more interesting creative choice that could have maybe spiced the movie up at least a little bit here and there. Well, I mean, it's it's a tough story to get into because it is... It, it, it is a purely atmospheric story for the majority of its running time. It is, wouldn't it be creepy if you ran into one of these middle of nowhere towns and it was empty? And that that's immediately like a great creepy idea. But the movie, the movie is not handled in a way that emphasizes the atmosphere. It that that's what I think would sell the story is if and that's why I say it's like if you just stuck with Bert and Vicky and their discovery of the town, then we're discovering it with them and being like, oh yeah, that is creepy. They yeah. showed up at the diner and, and everything's empty and they're looking at dates and it's been this long, you know, it's been almost 20 years since a photo was taken or something. And, and it's like, yeah, that's a, that is a creepy idea, but the, the movie isn't really focused on the atmosphere or as soon as it does try and do that, then we got to cut back to Job and Sarah and see what they're doing. And it's, it's unfortunate because I, like I said, again, I think the first act of this movie has some good setup to the point where I, I was genuinely shocked at when the inciting incident happens in which a, a kid who is being exiled uh, gets his throat cut and runs out into the middle of the road and is hit by a car. I was like, oh, I forgot that's how this all started. Yeah, it is one of those powerful moments that sort of make you think the movie is going to be better than it ends up being. And, you know, they start off strong, but eventually it just takes them way too long to get to the point. And when you have something that is a short story, you might have to make it a little longer for it to fit the film format because, you know, every once in a while, Stephen King will have a short story that's maybe 10 pages. And it's like, okay, how do we turn this into a feature length film? And I don't recall just how long Children of the Corn was, but I feel like given the source material, there was a lot more they could have done with the story 
in the movie. And like you said, it's just one of those things where you have ideas on how it could have been better, but it seems like people haven't really been interested in portraying this story that way on the big screen. And like I said, I don't know about any of the other movies aside from this one. But with this cast, I feel like you could have had something that was much better than it was, especially with Linda Hamilton's performance, just basically outperforming everyone else. Well, it's interesting. I, when I was watching this and I did the research and saw that King had had done a draft of the screenplay and that the big complaint from producers was that he had the first 30 minutes being, a, you know, the, the couple arguing in the car. I immediately thought of the film adaptation of Cujo. And one of the reasons why I think Cujo works is because that movie takes almost an hour or so before you get to the the selling point of the movie, which is a killer dog and a, and a mom and her child trapped in a car. That movie takes most of its running time building up these characters as characters, as, okay, what's going on with their relationship? We understand how each of them feel. We're, we're empathetic towards them. And then the horror really intrudes in their lives. And... I wish Children of the Corn had done that because if you made it about this couple and this incident and if if, if it ends up bringing them together or being the thing that ultimately separates them, as long as you made the movie about their relationship and then making this this fear, because symbolically, I wonder what is the purpose of the story? If it's if it's a couple as in the movie that are, you know, that the. The man is afraid of committing. Well, could this be that these kids represent a fear of parenthood? That it's like, oh, well, if if I commit to you and we try and have a family, now we're running into all these killer kids. This is <laughs> like my fear made flesh. Um, that's an interesting angle. But, but the movie never explores anything like that. It seems like it was just like, oh, cool, cr- creepy rural setting and killer kids. And some supernatural stuff we got to have in there because it's Stephen King and everybody expects there to be something supernatural. Um, Instead of exploring what I think some of the more interesting parts of the movie could be. And one of those interesting parts, even though it's not done so effectively by the end of the movie, is this entire mythology about he who walks behind the rose. Right. Uh, That is... That's an interesting thing to explore, but I don't think the movie ever really has has a genuine interest in doing that. What do you think about the town in general? Because one of the things that Stephen King has really been able to do over the years with his books is make these towns feel like characters. We know Castle Rock very well. We know Derry very well. And those are the towns that really stick in your memory when it comes to Stephen King's stories. But, you know, outside of the Overlook Hotel in The Shining, if anything takes place outside of Maine, it doesn't seem to have quite the same impact. And I don't know if that's just because Stephen King is so intensely familiar with Maine that he's... Mm -hmm much more able to make these towns feel like characters because he's familiar with the area. And even if they are fictional towns, they're based off of these places he's been to. And it was the same with the Overlook Hotel. So that hotel really felt like a character in the story. But to me, there could have been more done with the town in this too, to really make it feel like it was sort of the root of the story. Yeah, I think there's an opportunity to do that in the movie with somebody like the the gas station owner, because Gatlin feels like a town that exists in another dimension. Right. Like it, it doesn't feel because if, if there was a town that suddenly all the adults were murdered and nobody heard anything from that town, you would think there would be some kind of response in a, in a realistic setting. But in the way that it's set up here, it feels like, no, this is. It's like a Twilight Zone episode where you've just crossed over into this place that no one knows about, really. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That that is just bad news. And I think if there had been a community 
or, or, or more characters like the gas station owner who are outside of Gatlin and everybody, every, everybody's like, you don't, don't go there. Like you don't want to go down there. There's nothing there. And you know, being doomsayers kind of like nobody goes there. We've just written it out of existence. Um, that might better give you a sense of this place as something, you know, totally alien. But I, I, I think it's just a stand in creepy rural town. I don't, I don't think there's the only time we get kind of a sense of history of Gatlin are the little bits of information like, Oh, here they're at the diner or they talk about there being a police officer, which I, I just, this is just a random note and I have to get in. <laughs> I hate that the Job kid calls the officer Ossifer. It's that's like one of those little kid. It's like, yeah, do that. Cause that's how little kids talk. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's so annoying. It, it's so unreal. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think if we had maybe gotten to learn more about the history of Gatlin, uh, if, if I, I would have liked to have seen maybe a full sermon of Isaac's in the church where he's kind of, making implications about what has happened. Like they've captured Bert and Vicky and they're doing their whole spiel because there are cool moments. Like, like you say uh, in the cornfield with the corpse of the police officer on the cross made of corn. Yeah. It's, and they're like the blue man, they've created this entire mythology. I'm like, there's, there's interesting things here, but the movie only touches on it for seconds. And, and I think it's the kind of thing that people, if they saw this when they were young, um, or, or, you know, more impressionable, those are the kind of things that could have their brain spinning. But by the end of the movie, it's, I don't think anything's paid off enough to, to make those little tidbits interesting. Yeah, I kind of wish they would have made this town feel a little more like how they made the town feel at the end of Carrie, because mm. you have this big, tragic event that happens, and the town just becomes completely deserted and even though clearly Gatlin isn't completely deserted when you arrive it still has that feeling to it but in a way it's not quite as powerful as the ending of Carrie especially in the book where it's like hey you know this is kind of a government cover-up and that aspect would have almost been a little better maybe the government is just choosing to ignore this town but we never get any explanation like that it's just like oh hey here's a town with all the kids running it because they got rid of all the adults. <laughs> well, it's funny. Before we started recording, we were talking about the new season of True Detective. And th there's actually a through line here where the town where the events in True Detective take place or this is this very rural town. We see later uh, in, in the later time periods that that town is pretty much it's it's dead. Like yeah. it's just gone because because of the events that happened. And, and one of the characters says this town didn't die. It was murdered. And that's a, that's an interesting kind of somber and scary idea that a town can just die because of some horrible event. And that's what you literally have in Children of the Corn is a town being murdered by its own children. Um, and this idea that it could just be forgotten about, uh, you know, because it was already a, just a, you know, it's it wouldn't even show up on a map kind of place. Yeah. Uh, and and because that and that's even a, a moment where. Vicky and Bert are driving and they're looking at they like, keep seeing signs for Gatlin and they pull out the map and it's like, no, it's not on the map. It's like, that's how it it feels like it doesn't exist. And again, if the movie maybe made more, I don't I, I don't know if there needs to be a direct supernatural implication, like maybe he who walks behind the rose is clouding the, the town of some sort. But if the movie at least made some kind of thematic drive towards that idea, it it would feel more effective, but it doesn't. Yeah, well, I don't think I have too much more to say about this movie, but do you have <laughs> any final thoughts on it? For me, I kind of just wonder what would happen if someone were to take this story and make a true adaptation of it today, not a low budget student film or something like that, but maybe somewhere in the 10 to 15 million range so that it would have a chance at making its money back and then sort of just getting not necessarily A-list stars in the movie, but just getting some familiar faces and really diving into more of the lore versus just focusing on, hey, here's some crazy kids. Yeah, the it's funny you say that because I, I did want to recommend uh, to listeners, if, if this is a concept that you, th oh, like town full of killer kids that sounds like it has potential, 
There's actually a Spanish film from 1976, which, and I'm not accusing Stephen King of anything, but he published Children of the Corn in 1977. But this Spanish film is called Who Can Kill a Child? Uh, It's also called Island of the Damned, in which a couple are about to have their their third child, and they decide to go sailing uh, to kind of keep their marriage together and get ready for the birth of their new child. And they end up on this island where all the parents have been murdered and the kids did it. And there's no explanation as to exactly what is going on. The kids just kind of have some kind of unspoken connection and they decide that this is how they play is by murdering adults. And that, I mean, even by that original title, Who Can Kill a Child, that's already a a more difficult and interesting take on this, which Children of the Corn never uh, even begins to explore. It's like, well, if you were surrounded by killer kids, would you kill a kid to save yourself? Like, is... Would you feel morally okay with that? Um, that's a question that who can kill a child actually poses. And it's I think it's a better atmospheric movie. Uh, it's crazy. Like, it goes to some nutty places, which I won't spoil. But I, I like, I, I, I agree with you in that there is a kernel of a really good creepy idea here. Because I, I think we'll always, as a culture, be interested in killer kids. It's a it, it like I said, it speaks to our fears of parenthood. It speaks to fears of, well, what if our children are just wrong? Like, what if it's not a matter of raising? It's just their nature is that they're sociopathic or psychopathic. Like, that's a, a worthwhile fear to explore in fiction. But Children of the Corn is it's too all over the place. It doesn't know if it wants to focus on the killer kids angle or this kooky supernatural angle. It doesn't know if it wants to focus on this relationship between Bert and Vicky. It doesn't know if it wants to focus on two kids who aren't being susceptible to the, all this kookiness. It's just too all over the place. It doesn't, f- from a filmmaking standpoint, I don't think it it hits the mark enough to feel properly atmospheric or creepy. And <laughs> on one last comical note, this movie is has one of those endings that doesn't feel like an ending it just feels like the movie stops <laughs> yeah <laughs> where they they tried to manufacture a, a quickie jump scare at the end and then they deal with it and nothing's happened and they're like all right let's get out of here and <laughs> the end just came up and i cracked up i was like oh okay i guess i guess we're done <laughs> so yeah i i don't know it's 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 i don't remember from my research seeing a lot of positive reviews for it at the time but I think between the title, between Stephen King's name being on the poster, which was enough to sell a movie at that point, uh, its longevity through a number of sequels, uh, it's it's an important movie. Uh, it's a pretty decent short story, I, I have to admit, but yeah, I don't think it's aged well, and I think it's one that we can kind of be happy that we're done with <laughs> Yeah, I think I can honestly say I enjoyed this conversation more than I enjoyed the movie. (laughs) So (laughs) there is that, at least. Sometimes it is fun to talk about things that aren't so great. (laughs) I'll second that, that feeling. Well, Drew, thank you so much for coming on to talk about Children of the Corn. You will be braving another one of the movies here in the near future. Oh yes, I I staked one out because I I do know. I'm like, no, no, no. This one this one has things definitely worth talking about. So I'll, I'll be back for that. Yeah, and to our listeners, you can find us at Chat Cemetery on Twitter and Instagram. And as always, thank you all for listening and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. 